I think it's always interesting when you can look at a human being from all sides and not necessarily purely a side that you might have a reactive or very myopic Hmm. response to, but are able to see all sides of the coin. Julian Anderson has played some truly iconic TV roles. From the one and only Dana Scully in The X-Files, to Gene Milburn, the sex therapist in sex education, to a critically acclaimed performance as Margaret Thatcher in The Crown. Anderson embodies her roles so fully that her characters really do take on lives of their own. And over the course of her career, she's won two Emmys and two Golden Globes for both The X-Files and The Crown. And in her new film, Scoop, Anderson plays the real-life journalist Emily Maitlis, who landed the infamous 2019 interview with Prince Andrew about his friendship with notorious sex offender Jeffrey Epstein. It's a movie about journalism, scandal, and the unique role of the royal family. And in it, Anderson dramatizes a historical event that happened only a few years ago, yet already looms large in our collective memory. Scoop comes out April 5th on Netflix. I caught up with Anderson from London, and in our conversation, we talked about her adolescent punk phase, how she became Dana Scully, and the challenges of taking on roles based on real people and events. I'm Charlotte Alter, senior correspondent for Time, and this is Person of the Week. So I understand that your childhood was split between the U.S. and London. Can you tell me a little bit about what that was like? Where did you feel like was your true home when you were growing up? Well, we moved away from the States when I was six months old. Mm -hmm. So I was born in Chicago. And we first moved to Puerto Rico. And we lived there for about a year and a half. And then we moved to London. and so. My early memories were more a mix of the beach in Puerto Rico and this new city of London. And so that was my childhood. You know, first time I was really properly speaking was with a British accent. My schools were British. My friends were British. But then what would happen is in the summertime, we would go visit American relatives. Mm -hmm. And America was always the land of sunshine and candy. (laughs) And so when it was determined that we were actually going to move for a period of time to the States, that's what I thought Hmm. America was going to be. We moved to Grand Rapids, Michigan, which also has candy. (laughs) And I suddenly felt as slightly displaced as I had felt in London having American parents, because even though for all intents and purposes, I was English. My parents were what they called Yanks. Hmm. So there was part of me that felt more home at that point in life in the UK, because that's what I knew. But there was part of me that wanted to feel more home in the US, but that didn't come till I think much later. And so, you know, it seems like this dynamic kind of led you to feeling like a little bit of an outsider. And I heard that you were sort of a punk in high school. Um, Can you tell us about that? You know, what did the punk scene mean to you at the time? And are there any parts of the punk ethos that you think have kind of stuck with you? Well, I don't know where exactly this started, but I do feel like there's always been a part of me that has felt intrinsically anti-establishment. And I don't know whether that's just in the face of any authority, but uh, I think there was an element of feeling so displaced Hmm. and early teenage angst and a lot of anger, Hmm. a lot of anger that I felt was siphoned through that kind of, you know, through Dead Kennedys, through Bauhaus, through Circle Jerks, um, Chili Peppers. (laughs) I, I just said there were a lot of bands that I felt said what I wanted to say out loud, or at least express the same emotions that I was feeling inside. And at the time I had a boyfriend um, and our whole life was literally 
band <laughs> band practice, yeah. punk band practice, me hanging around concerts, going to Kalamazoo, Lansing, seeing whoever was in town playing and mm-hmm. having mohawks and pointy boots and and walking around flipping everybody in downtown Grand Rapids off because they turned and stared at us. And that was kind of what we did. So then you ended up at the theater school at DePaul University in Chicago. How do you think that experience contributed to your later career? Um, I think it had a huge influence on me for many, many reasons. One was I never lived in halls. I lived in an apartment about a half hour a bike ride away. I was still, you know, I looked like I was straight out of the cure. <laughs> and there was one teacher who was my hero and I wanted to impress him really badly because I felt like he forgave me my strangeness. Mm. He understood me and accepted me for who I was. And he also saw talent and he kept me coming back. And you were cast in the X-Files really not that long after you graduated. You were 24, right? Yeah, I was 24, but I I told them I was 27. (laughs) Why did you tell them you were 27? Because it didn't make sense to me that Dana Scully would have had the accolades that she had and gone as far as she had in terms of her education and um, Hmm. being where she was in the FBI uh, as a 24-year-old. And I also felt like people would believe me less if I looked and sounded like I did and I was 24. Right. That somehow I I was more valid Mm -hmm. as her at 27. So what was it like to have this huge career-defining role really so early in your career? Well, on the one hand, what was lucky was that it came in piecemeal. At first, it was the pilot, as Mm -hmm. always used to happen. And then we didn't know whether we were going to do any more shows. And so then Fox uh, decided that they were going to let us do 13. And so it really went piecemeal. It went step by step. So had I jumped into something that I was told in advance we were going to do nine seasons, Mm -hmm. I think I would have found it much more challenging. Right. As it was, as a 24-year-old, having done pretty much nothing else other than college plays and an off-Broadway play prior to that, it was, you know, it was pretty intense. We we were also blessed in that we were shooting in Vancouver because there wasn't the regularity of paparazzi in Vancouver as there was in Los Angeles. So we weren't followed everywhere we went. And also then I got pregnant in the first season and had a child, obviously, from that point on. And so not being followed, you know, to work every day and everywhere I went with a child and doing that show was a huge gift. Yeah. So what was it like to be a new mother while you're taking on this huge role and this huge moment in your career? I mean, I'm wondering how you thought about sort of this big moment in your career coinciding with this big moment in your life? So firstly, on the one hand, I didn't know any better. That was my sole experience. And so I didn't know that it could be any other way Mm -hmm. (laughs) in terms of how hard we worked. I thought that's how hard everybody worked who was doing television. I didn't realize that, you know, doing 24 episodes a, a year and you know, pretty much being a two-hander was more challenging by some margin than a lot of what else was out there. And so it really wasn't until it was press coming and saying, how are you dealing with all this? That I would stop to think, actually, how am I dealing with all of this? Right, people right. would say, oh my God, it's been such a whirlwind. And my response was always, you know, has it? Is it? Isn't everybody's life like that? I had no sense of the fact hmm. that I was in a unique situation that might be also uniquely challenging because of the hours and et cetera. But, you know, from the time that Piper was quite young, her father and I were no longer together. I had the miracle of a nanny who I would not have been able to do it without. 
she made it completely possible. And Mm -hmm. I mean, Piper grew up in my trailer and, you know, she would stay in there until I went home at whatever time it was. And then she would sleep in my bed because sometimes those were the hours that we got to see each other the most, you know what I mean? And so that's what we did. And, and I tried to put as much attention on her when I wasn't on set or working on lines and you do what you have to do. Mm -hmm. So this show had so much real world influence beyond just sort of the science fiction fandom. And I'm thinking specifically about the Scully effect, where there was a study that found that seeing your character actually influenced women's interest in STEM. What do you make of that influence? Why do you think this character was so influential? Well, there was a big study that was done by the Gina Davis project that had made that fact more publicly known that was talking about the influence of women culturally. And the facts were that at the time that we were airing, there weren't a lot of other women on Mm -hmm. television who had agency, who were intelligent, who were as forthright and smart and capable and educated as Dana Scully was. You know, what we had seen on television right at the time was Baywatch. And so she was a very new kind of woman. Mm -hmm. And not only was she a forensic pathologist, but she was an FBI agent, a doctor, a scientist. And so she was a, a professional woman and women were seeing her for the first time and going, I want to be that. I want to do that. I see myself represented in that. And Mm -hmm. I haven't seen myself represented before. And suddenly she made it okay for women to be smart and professional and have agency. And so it had a big influence on young women. When we come back, Anderson talks about some of her recent roles, including her latest film, Scoop. More in a moment. So after The X-Files, you worked on a whole slew of other films and TV shows, but I want to specifically ask you about Sex Education, which was a critically acclaimed series that ran from 2019 through 2023, and in it, you play a sex therapist. And since taking on this role, you've become sort of an activist around sexual wellness. Why was this cause so important to you? Um, I mean, on the one hand, I would say that it's come to me... By accident, Hmm. sex education was a job like any other job that I said yes to, and I wouldn't have guessed that it would have led to a bigger conversation for me specifically around sexual wellness, Hmm. but it has because uh, Jean Milburn, the character that I play, is for all intents and purposes a sex therapist, and, and also the impact that the series has had, period, on sex education, the conversation around sex education and sexual wellness, and in terms of kind of creating a very frank, neutral space for these conversations to be able to be had in a way that they haven't often been had before in Mm -hmm. a public forum. Hmm. I'm doing a book with Bloomsbury where we had asked women from around the world to write in with their sexual fantasies anonymously. Wow. And I do introductions to each of the chapters. But I think I was probably asked to do that because I did sex education. Right. And it feels very on topic for me to be that person having that conversation. And it's also important for us to, what what one of the charities that I've been working with lately in the UK is called Wellbeing of Women. And they do research into specifically women's health issues, which are often underfunded in the UK, in Europe, in the US. And so that's why. So another one of your most famous roles was that you played Margaret Thatcher in The Crown. How did you approach playing somebody who is a real historical figure who people actually remember? 
Thatcher is an interesting character because uh, she's so divisive, particularly in the UK, because there were a lot of people, as I said, who were completely enamored of her. And there are a great many people who absolutely revile her and everything that she stood for and everything that they would say she did to their family, their country, their pocketbook. And so people have very, very strong feelings about her over here. So I think what I'm grateful for is that how she was drawn within the context of the series of The Crown felt like it was very three-dimensional. And you got to to see a three-dimensional version of her that had not really been exposed before or seen quite in that way. And I think it's always interesting when you can look at a human being from all sides and not necessarily purely a side that you might have a reactive or very myopic Hmm. response to, but are able to see all sides of the coin. And I feel like the series did that. And so now in your latest project, you're playing somebody living. You're playing BBC journalist Emily Maitlis, uh, who's a major figure in British media. And this latest film, Scoop, follows her infamous 2019 Newsnight interview with Prince Andrew about his connections to Jeffrey Epstein, the notorious sex trafficker. Why did you pick this project? Was this a story that you had been following in real time? Well, it was a very big story over here, as you can imagine, Mm -hmm. because it involved the royal family, which the British public are uniquely obsessed with. But also the BBC is another institution. It's another old establishment in the UK. And so it was really a moment in time where two very, very big British establishments were coming together. And under normal circumstances, the BBC might not even air an interview that was so potentially damning Mm -hmm. of a member of the royal family. You know, the thing about Newsnight is independent journalism. And so it's evidence of the fact that when there is independent journalism, there is a opportunity and a, a responsibility to hold authority to account, even if mm-hmm. that is a member of the royal family. It was quite a unique situation. There is not another example of a member of the royal family being interviewed in that wow. way. The next example of that was, I believe, Oprah talking to Harry and Meghan. Wow. Wow which was something in and of itself. And so it was a scoop (laughs) that they got that. And it was unique. And also the fact that after the fact, Prince Andrew and his uh, team thought that it went incredibly successfully. Mm. And that was not necessarily the case at all, as we found out when it aired. So yes, it was a big deal over here, but it was also, it's a Peter Moffat script and Mm -hmm. I've been a fan of Peter Moffat's writing for a long time. I've also wanted to work with Philip Martin, the director. And, you know, it was a script with four very strong female characters that was incredibly well-written and felt like a welcome challenge to take on and Emily. I've been a big fan of Emily for a while. I listen to her on a regular basis. I think she's an extraordinary journalist. So a large portion of this film is a recreation of the interview itself with you and Rufus Sewell as Prince Andrew. Um, What went into that performance? The interview itself, actually, the original interview was about an hour long. Our interview is only 10 minutes long. Hmm. And it may feel a bit longer because we are also, we also show some of the rehearsal process and the decisions that um, the journalists made about how to approach him, the kinds of questions to ask. They locked themselves away for days to rehearse 
how the interview might go and how hard to hit it, how front-footed. At what point do you bring up the difficult questions? How much are you placating? So, you know, discussing technique and what they obviously didn't want to do was to finally get in there and then drive him out of the room. It was in his control at any moment to feel like the questions are just getting too much or too personal or none of their business. And he could have Mm -hmm. just got up and then they wouldn't have had that interview and they would have lost that opportunity, but also potentially also have lost any opportunity in the future to ever be in a similar situation, being able to interview a member of the royal family in that way. So it was quite a big deal Hmm. for them. The fact that they even got it was a big deal. And we had discussed, we being me and Philip and Rufus, had discussed what the options were in terms of how it could be shot. And as you will see in the film, it's intercut with a lot of other actions that are taking place at the same time. You Mm -hmm. see reactions from people in the room. You see other things happening back at the BBC. But we decided we were going to just do the interview from beginning to end. And so that meant, obviously, a different type of preparation for Rufus and I, that we would be verbatim memorizing the interview, Hmm. uh, you know, 10, 11 minutes sitting there. And so the way they had set it up was with all of the cameras that we were using to shoot it, but also all of the cameras that were actually there on the day, all the little six cameras that were actually present during the real interview. And so there were six to eight cameras filming at the same time. So it was able to capture the interview and we were basically able to run it as if we were doing a scene from a play almost. And so we basically came in to work that day. There was no rehearsal. We just basically sat down, got mic'd up and made sure that our positions were correct for how it was in real life. And he said, action. So you've now been in two projects, The Crown and Scoop, that are kind of about this cultural fascination with the royal family and its relationship with the press. What did you learn about the royal family and this sort of unique press relationship over the course of working on these two projects? You know, The Crown, as much as anything, is about the relationships with the prime ministers, that this single queen was alive through, what, uh, 15 prime ministers during her lifetime. And that was what the initial impetus was for the series to begin with and the play before it that it was based on. And so I was just one of those many prime ministers, you know. And so it was as much as anything, therefore, about the delicate balance between the crown and the politics at the time. Hmm. And and yes, there there was an element in the storyline with Thatcher and the queen in terms of press because the crown is never meant to comment publicly about things political. Hmm. And Thatcher felt at one point that she had done so. And I, I think, if I recall, accused her as much for... Scoop, that's a very different thing. And I think that's certainly something that is more and more on topic today. One, because of what Harry has been doing Mm -hmm. and his legal cases against various newspapers over here and the degree to which they had been listening in to his private conversations. But also he's been very vocal publicly about the degree to which the royal family period is beholden to the press and what Mm -hmm. a relationship that is that, you know, they don't like it, but they're in bed with them. They let the press know where they're going to be at what time they rely on them to keep them on the front pages, to keep them relevant. But at the same time, they don't want them to tell too much of the truth about what's going on. Right. So, uh, What is next for you this year? What projects do you have in the works that you're really excited about? I've recently launched a a drink that's called G-Spot. And uh, it's a natural soft drink and it has adaptogens and nootropics in it. So it's uh, good for cognitive function Hmm. and 
uh, natural energy and immune systems and numerous things. It has lots of mushrooms in it. <laughs> um, let's see. I'm about to go off to shoot uh, The Abandons, which hmm. is a Netflix series, a Western. I'm going to be doing that for the next few months. It's basically two matriarchs, me and Lena Headey, cool. uh, facing off in the Wild West. Wow. Count me in. I will definitely watch that. <laughs> and then I've got Salt Path, which is coming out at the end of the year, which is based on a book by the same name, me and Jason Isaacs, Walking the Coast Path of the UK. It, it was a it's fantastic, beautifully written book by Rainer Wynn and Sons of Indy. It's coming out uh, later in the year. Jillian, it's been so wonderful talking to you all about your career and the influence of your work and your latest movie, Scoop. But now I want to get to know a little bit more about the everyday things that influence you in a segment we like to call The Last Time. So, when is the last time you listened to The Dead Kennedys? Um, a decade ago. A decade ago? A decade ago. Okay, so not such a huge fan anymore. <laughs> <laughs> There's a few others that I have more recently, just to keep myself up. <laughs> okay, when's the last time you dyed your hair red? Recently, very recently, like within the last month and a half. Mm, okay, was there a particular reason? A job. Yeah. A job, but it was an element that I had uh, requested. Hmm, okay. Um when is the last time you talked about sexual wellness with your kids? Last weekend. <laughs> <laughs> when was the last time you saw a Dana Scully action figure? <gasps> last week. Really? Yeah. Oh my God. There are so many like up. Uh, uh, I was needing to explain to somebody about the role of the Scully and Mulder action figures in world politics. <laughs> or some, some really important context. <laughs> okay. When is the last time you made a bold fashion choice? Oh, I, I would say probably in January at the Golden Globes. Mm -hmm. I wore a dress covered in bulbous Gabriella Hurst, mm -hmm. who designed that dress. I knew that I was going to be going to the Golden Globes, and I asked if she would design a dress that had that image on them. And her team went above and beyond and created the most glorious, gorgeous version of what that might look like was the most exquisite thing ever. So I was, I was very lucky that, that my silly little <laughs> idea just turned into this extraordinary uh, piece of art. Well, I thought it was a very cool dress. Thank you. Jillian, thank you so much for being here with us today. I loved Scoop. I am really excited to get to talk to you. So thank you so much for making the time. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. You can see Jillian Anderson in Scoop starting April 5th on Netflix. Thank you so much for listening to Person of the Week. If you like what you heard, don't forget to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And we'd love to hear from you. So send your tips or thoughts on our show to personoftheweek at time.com. I'm Charlotte Alter. See you next week. Person of the Week is hosted by Charlotte Alter. It's produced by Nina Bisbano and Allison Bailey. Our senior producer is Ursula Summer. Our story editor is Katie Feather. This episode was mixed by Joe Plord. Our theme music was composed by Billy Libby. Joseph Frischmuth is our fact checker. Person of the Week is a co-production of Time Studios and Sugar 23. At Time, our executive producers are Dave O'Connor, Michael Erlinger, and Sam Jacobs. At Sugar 23, our executive producers are Mike Mayer, Michael Sugar, and Liam Billingham. Sasha Mathias is the head of audio at Time. You can find us online at time.com slash person of the week and wherever you get your podcasts. <laughs>